somewhere in the Pacific, crewmen aboard the aircraft carrier Abraham Lincoln keep their edge through a series of constant drills. During combat, each of these planes will carry tons of deadly explosives. The Lincoln's vast arsenal of bombs is stored below decks, ready to strike when the order comes. So this is our finished product, the GBU-31 Victor II. Of course, we have the bomb body assembly. We have the strikes, which will actually stabilize the weapon's movement and flight as it heads toward its target. There's a lot of danger involved down here because if we don't do our job right, something very bad could happen to the ship and the crew. The ordnance crew has no more demanding and dangerous duty than transporting the world's most advanced bombs to the flight deck. They're going to pull the weapons off the uh, elevator car, and they're going to perform a weapons inspection on them now. These weapons are inspected through every step of the process, from the magazines to the hangar bay, and again on the flight deck. He's going to check all the electrical connectors and pins to ensure that we're going to have a positive electrical connection. This is a satellite-guided weapon, so he's checking the antenna now. OK, we're moving the weapons to the bomb farm now. It's a two-person rule for safety. Whenever you're moving a skid of weapons, this weapon weighs about 1,000 pounds. The final step in this exacting process is securing the bombs to the aircraft. Stop! Good. In the forward, in the forward, in the forward. Once I'm locked up and ready to go, let's get right there. Let's get right there. check my whole pylon, make sure my pylon's still on the jet, make sure all my pins are up, make sure all my pins are flush. I got the pin back here that's in there. Got to make sure it's good and on. This cable that he's going to put on right now makes the aircraft to the GPS system and the bomb. Make sure the bomb knows where it's going. Right before the bomb comes off, it feeds all the systems to it. The pride that comes with wearing the uniform never seems to change. Every day I'm up here, it's always a good experience to come up here and know that uh, I'm doing something to protect my country and help my shipmates out whenever I can. It's not only one jet that I'm loading. I got other jets around this jet. If something happens, if something can go wrong, somebody, somebody can die, and I, I can't have that. The weapons of war, however, are ever-changing. This ordnance team has just loaded a bomb that can see through clouds and strike within yards of its target. A bomb that 40 years ago was the stuff of science fiction. Until the 1960s, all aerial bombs were gravity driven. They simply hit wherever gravity and wind currents carried them. But they were rarely accurate, killed indiscriminately, and required multiple strikes to achieve success. But the modern battlefield is dominated by smaller, more accurate, smart bombs designed to surgically eliminate military targets. We don't have to drop something down that, that'll take out an entire city block because we don't know which part of the block it's going to land in. Now we can put it in a certain building to now we get to the point where we can put it in the third story window of a certain building. The Iraq Wars of 1991 and 2003 demonstrated how bombs have evolved into precise, sophisticated weapons. During Operation Desert Storm, the U.S. used 7,400 tons of guided munitions. In Operation Iraqi Freedom, more than 10,000 tons. Unlike missiles, smart bombs cannot propel themselves. But the advanced hardware they pack enables them to guide a path with stunning accuracy. Smart bombs rely on smart people. A laser-guided bomb depends on either a second aircraft or a soldier on the ground, getting close enough to the target to mark it with a laser. Since the beam reveals the position of those transmitting it, the laser is aimed at the last possible moment. The bomb, already in flight, then zeroes in on the mark. You release the bomb before you put the spot on the target. You put the spot on the ground or over on a wall or over on a tree, and then you move it because it takes a finite amount of time for that weapon to get to the tank. 
and the tanks sometimes turn around and shoot the laser operator, and he don't like that. Another type of smart bomb, a TV-guided weapon, is steered remotely by a bombardier operating video game-like controls. A TV-guided weapon, when you saw it, as it got closer to the target, the target got bigger, bigger, and bigger until it flashed out because you're seeing the camera moving closer and closer to the target. Although 1990s-era smart bombs struck with great precision, they relied on visual identification of targets. Cloud cover or smoke from fires could obscure targets and force the cancellation of bombing missions. No on the target. I say again, I can't see the target. In 1991, immediately after Desert Storm, engineers began seeking a solution. They knew the U.S. needed an all-weather smart bomb. It needed JDAM. Joint Direct Attack Munitions. Uh, JDAM has been used in combat in Kosovo, Afghanistan, and Iraq, and something on the order of 15,000 JDAMs have been dropped in combat. JDAM converts conventional gravity-driven bombs into smart ones. A tail kit containing a global positioning system and inertial navigation system monitors is attached to existing 500, 1,000, or 2,000 pound freefall bombs. This is a JDAM guidance kit. Right now it's attached to a 2,000 pound Mark 84 warhead. And just about this section here is the heart or brains of the navigation and guidance function. I brought along a unit here. This is the mission computer. On this side is an inertial measurement unit that has the sensors from the INS, and in the middle is a GPS receiver card. JDAM's navigation monitors send signals to movable tail fins that maintain the bomb's flight path. It consistently strikes within three meters of its target and operates under all atmospheric conditions. The JDAM weapon is useful in all weather. So clouds, smoke, it doesn't make any difference. You've launched it from an altitude, you've told it where to go, it will go to that point on the Earth. JDAM was originally designed to take out fixed high-value targets, but its astonishing accuracy made it a powerful tool against mobile targets deployed near American troops. In Afghanistan, some new things happened. Special Forces troops were put on the ground. They were provided with equipment that would allow them to actually get coordinates of targets, and they were able to call in JDAMs on targets that they were actually seeing there that were uh, stationary, but maybe had moved very recently. This is a, a close air support role rather than what was originally thought of as a high-value target attack mode. In years to come, JDAM will be supplemented by an even smaller and smarter bomb. Small diameter bomb is the next step in uh, the evolution of uh, miniaturizing weapons. Small diameter bomb is a 250 pound weapon, but with about 35 pounds of explosives in it. It has diamond back wing that gives it the ability to fly. This is a small diameter bomb mock-up. It's about six feet long, about 250 pounds. This is the configuration that it would be in when it's stowed on the aircraft so that it's sleek and aerodynamic. The wings are folded in, the tails are folded in. Once it's launched and dropped off the airplane, the wings will extend, open up like this. The tails will be popping out also. From there on, it will glide itself for 40 or 40 plus miles until it impacts the target. Small diameter bombs enable planes to carry more weapons and pilots to fly fewer sorties. Smaller bombs also create opportunities to strike multiple targets during a single mission. Now we'll take up a B-1 with 96 small diameter bombs in it and hit 96 different targets and hit them precisely and with very, very minimal collateral damage. Another type of bomb known as the sensor-fused weapon, or SFW, unleashes many warheads towards multiple targets. Once the SFW is released from the aircraft, gas bags that resemble car airbags inflate and push out 10 separate submunitions. Parachutes then deploy from each submunition, slowing their fall and bringing them into a vertical descent over the target area. At a predetermined height, the parachutes eject 
and rocket motors fire, stopping the descent. Once the rockets burn out, each submunition releases four warheads that scan a target area of about 30 acres. Once the explosive is detonated, that projectile fired at hyper velocities into the target and it penetrates the armor plating. Uh, once through that armor plating, it starts to destroy the individual components below that armor. SFWs are the smartest of the smart, able to track moving targets and distinguish between jeeps and tanks. Each of the 40 warheads has a laser sensor that searches for changes in height, such as the distinctive contour of a vehicle. At the same time, infrared sensors seek heat signatures like those emitted by the hot engine of a target vehicle. SFWs played a critical role in Operation Iraqi Freedom. We had uh, lighter armored uh, Marine forces making their initial push into Baghdad, starting to come into the lead elements of the Iraqi Guard uh, that were positioning themselves to ambush and uh, potentially uh, attack the U.S. forces uh, entering that area. Called in SFW strikes, and the uh, passes of those weapons absolutely decimated the Iraqi uh, Guard troops before they were able to effectively employ against the Marine units. During the height of Operation Iraqi Freedom, SFWs were used 68 times to devastate enemy forces. Sensor-fused weapons are at the cutting edge of so-called data link munitions, bombs able to identify targets and adjust to attack the highest value kill. Finely tuned image seekers and complex computer algorithms will soon increase the level of information and may eventually be able to distinguish between hostile and friendly targets. While the first Gulf War accelerated the development of smaller bombs, it also led to the creation of the largest non-nuclear device ever made, the mother of all bombs. March 11th, 2003, marked a milestone in military history. At Eglin Air Force Base in Florida, the United States tested a new superweapon. MOAB, short for Massive Ordnance Airburst, quickly became known as the mother of all bombs. This massive weapon creates a blast radius stretching a mile in each direction. The MOAB is made out of an aluminum skin, a very thin aluminum skin. And the reason we did it that way was in order to maximize the blast effect. We do not want the airframe of the bomb to interfere with the development of the blast wave that has the impact to the target. The world's largest non-nuclear weapon, MOAB is over 30 feet long and weighs more than 21,000 pounds. It's no easy task to accurately maneuver such a behemoth through the skies toward its target. Engineers overcame the challenge with a grid fin design that provides great aerodynamic lift. Uh, during carriage, these four grid fins are folded forward onto the bomb in order that it makes a very compact uh, design for carriage. When the weapon is deployed, out the back end of the C-130, the fins are subsequently deployed with aerodynamic assisting in the deployment because the wind is coming from the forward of the bomb. Uh, once it's in its flight configuration, as it is shown here, it is then able to control the bomb and fly it to its designated target. Although Moab was fast-tracked for Operation Iraqi Freedom, the lack of enemy resistance kept it grounded. But its successful test run served chilling notice of a powerful new force. The largest guided bomb in the history of the world, with the tremendous impact and detonation of this explosive, really just shook the area. And the shockwave could be heard for miles and miles. The deadly potential of bombs such as MOAB is the result of hundreds of years of evolving technology. In the seventh century came the invention of Greek fire, a kind of primitive napalm used mainly in ship-to-ship -ship combat. It was a terror weapon of its day. 
The formula was either never written down or was lost. It was regarded as a great military secret of the time, you know, much as nuclear technology is today. In 12th century Europe, a new substance emerged with one great advantage. It exploded. Black powder, what we know as gunpowder, was believed to have such mysterious powers that some deemed it a tool of the devil. Its mixture of sulfur, charcoal, and saltpeter produced the first true explosive. Of course, the first cannon came along at the time, too, and they would fire a simple iron ball. But sooner or later came the idea, why can't we hollow out the cannonball and use it to make a bomb? And so they did. In 16th as in 20th century warfare, precision was more important than brute force. Cannonballs gave way to smaller, yet still powerful, hand grenades. The term grenade actually comes from the Spanish granado, which means pomegranate, which a grenade looks like. If you saw a grenade of the period, say, of the uh, uh, 16th or 17th century, it looks very much like the, the bombs you see on the cartoon shows. It'd be a round ball with a, a fuse sticking out of the top. For grenadiers, bravery was the first order of business. They carried up to a dozen highly volatile three-pound iron grenades right to the front lines. Then they lit the fuses and threw the grenades at the last moment before quickly retreating. Grenadiers are famous because they were brave and they were big. And they were the real shock troops of the day. Grenades used in the American Civil War were detonated by percussion caps a recent invention that eliminated the reliance on an exposed, delicate flame trailing down a fuse. The percussion system involved a thin metal cap containing black powder or a similar substance that exploded on impact. When detonated, a spark shot into the main charge, igniting it. In 1846, the Italian chemist Ascanio Sobrero invented nitroglycerin a highly volatile mixture of sulfuric and nitric acids and glycerin. Simply tapping a jar of nitroglycerin was enough to trigger an explosion. They say it'll go off if you look at it cross-eyed. But it was Alfred Nobel, around 1866, came up with the concept of taking this dreadfully dangerous liquid and infusing it through clay basically making a solid that could then be packed into a cylinder or into a cardboard sheath and used as an explosive. By stabilizing the nitroglycerin, Nobel had created a far more controllable substance, dynamite. He then modified the percussion cap so that only an electrical charge would ignite it. You can take a stick of dynamite and you could whack it on the table or drive a nail into it anything of that nature, and chances are it would not go off. TNT is very similar to dynamite, but it's also malleable, enabling it to be molded into bombs of any shape. TNT was developed at the dawn of the 20th century, just in time for it to be used in the bloodiest conflict yet seen in human history. Modern bombing missions are highly complex operations, planned to the last detail. Going out the door, walking to your jet, you know what target you're going for. As soon as you get into range of that target, you're dropping automatically. High-tech bombs help pilots distance themselves from harm's way. The more complex and more accurate we can get our weapons, the better it makes me feel as a pilot. Being able to stand off from the target and release a weapon is, is, is a comforting feeling. History's first aerial bombers were right in the thick of the action. After the advent of airplanes early in the 20th century, military leaders adapted them for combat and changed warfare forever. There weren't any bomb sites or bomb racks, but you could take a artillery shell and have fins fabricated for it and uh, drop it over the side just by hand using an eyeball to uh, estimate it and, and uh, maybe hurt somebody by chance. And so uh, they, each side did that. Aviation technology progressed rapidly. By 1918, single-engine biplanes had been replaced by multi-engine aircraft, capable of carrying a 1,000 pounds of bombs. 
as airplanes get larger and have more powerful engines, can lift more payload, they can carry bigger bombs. We see the concept of an air power doctrine being developed of masses of airplanes, of fighters escorting bombers, of reconnaissance or spy aircraft. So much of what we see over the next 60 years in aviation had its birth in World War I. Two decades after the war to end all wars, World War II sparked a massive escalation in aerial bombardment. Huge raids, first by the Germans and then by the Allies, demonstrated the destructive power of the conventional aerial bomb. The most devastating raids used incendiaries, bombs filled with gasoline that burst into flames on impact. On a March night in 1945, swarms of Allied bombers turned Tokyo into a raging fireball. The first wave of planes dropped high explosives to blow the roofs off buildings, exposing vulnerable timber. That wood was then ignited by hundreds of planes dropping thousands of incendiaries. Temperatures soared above 2,700 degrees Fahrenheit. As hot air rose rapidly, cold air rushed in from the outside, sucking people into the firestorm. Certainly more people were killed in that attack than were in the first atomic bomb attack. World War II gave rise to carpet bombing, blanketing a vast area with thousands of bombs that might land anywhere. Most sighting equipment for bombardiers was crude and ineffective. Tacticians demanded a better method. The whole science that we're talking about is not that the bomb is such a wonderful device. It's putting it exactly where you want it. In World War II, you could deliver them with much more precision. First with the famous American Norton bomb site, which could drop a bomb in pickle barrel from 25,000 feet, which, given ideal conditions, it could. The Norton bomb site was one of the first mechanical computers. A bombardier adjusted knobs and levers to set a series of miniature gears. He keyed in several variables, the exact flight path, the plane's airspeed, latest updates on crosswinds, distance to the target. Finally, the bombardier made one last sighting on the target and activated the bomb site. The Norden then took control of the airplane, guiding it during the final moments and automatically releasing the payload. The Norden bomb site was a big improvement over anything else that existed in those days. In fact, hardly anything more than a X on a canopy was available before that. Hitler's Third Reich pioneered other frontiers in bomb development. Their method for propelling bombs was rather simple in theory. Attach them to jet engines. Hitler named his new guided missile the V-1, for Vengeance 1. The harbinger of modern missile warfare were the German V-1 guided missiles, the very simple weapon traveled a couple of hundred miles. Its fuel would cut off at a certain point, and it would just nose over, hit the target. Uh, accuracy was very poor. The V-1 program, however, was just part of Germany's plan for ultimate victory. In 1938, German scientists fueled Hitler's dream of world conquest when they discovered nuclear fission. Very quickly, that information spread throughout the scientific community. The moment that information spread, it was immediately realized that this, this discovery could be used to make a great source of energy or a bomb. By 1942, the threat of Germany producing a nuclear weapon compelled American leaders to take bold action. race was on to create the world's first atomic bomb. Today, the awesome destructive power of nuclear weapons is a basic fact of life. The knowledge needed to create atomic bombs is widely accessible, 
Only the scarcity of nuclear materials limits their proliferation. In the 1930s, only a handful of scientists envisioned the possibilities of nuclear weapons. Nuclear fission requires an extremely dense material, such as uranium or plutonium, which becomes the core of the bomb. The atomic bomb goes off because you have a mass of plutonium struck by a neutron that gives you fission that produces more neutrons, that hits more plutonium and gives you more fission, releasing more neutrons. That's what they call a chain reaction. And it just goes on until the whole thing blows apart. It takes less than a millionth of a second. Hitler held an early lead in the atomic race destined to redefine the course of history. But he squandered his advantage by threatening his best scientists. The problem was so many of the German scientists were Jewish. And Hitler had no use for Jewish science or Jewish scientists. And so many of them escaped, came to the United States, carried on the idea. And eventually, they realized that this could lead to practical results as a controlled explosion, a bomb. Scientists, including the great Albert Einstein, worried that Germany might still become the first nation to produce an atomic bomb. Hungarian refugee physicists in the United States, Leo Szilard and Edward Teller, encouraged Einstein to write a letter to President Franklin Roosevelt, urging him to speed development of a nuclear weapon. They knew they needed Einstein's clout to get the president's ear. Szilard actually wrote a letter. Einstein was on summer vacation at the north end of Long Island. And Szilard, a very ingenious man, knew everything in the world, except he did not know how to drive a car. So he asked me to drive him to Einstein. When Einstein read what he, what Szilard has written, asked a few questions about it, and then said, yes, yes, and signed it. Einstein's urging and the looming threat of an atomic bomb in the hands of the Nazis compelled Roosevelt to take action. In late 1942, he authorized the Manhattan Project, an all-out effort to build the world's first atomic bomb. It soon became one of the most ambitious undertakings in American history. It was 150,000 people, $20 billion in today's money, and it literally spread from sea to sea, from Hanford, where they were making plutonium, back to Oak Ridge, where they were making enriched uranium and U-235. Every major university, every major corporation in America was involved. Los Alamos, New Mexico, was chosen as the headquarters of the project. Far from the coasts, the tiny city could be neither observed nor bombed from the air. Its climate permitted outdoor work year-round. It also had a rail line to transport personnel and supplies, as well as a complex of school buildings that could be converted to engineering labs. As secret as the Manhattan Project was, the kids at the Los Alamos Ranch School were no dummies. When two special visitors arrived, the students recognized them instantly. They were international physicists nuclear physicists that they had seen in their textbooks. So the kids knew something big was going to happen, and it was going to involve nuclear physics. For the next 27 months, scientists raced the clock to create the world's first atomic bomb. They toiled day and night, squeezing a decade's worth of advances in physics and engineering into a handful of months. In the summer of 1945, Manhattan Project scientists put the finishing touches on the bomb. On July 16th, in southern New Mexico, engineers prepared to test it. Codenamed the Gadget, it was hoisted atop a huge tower. Some scientists worried that the chain reaction they hoped to trigger would fail to occur. Others feared the opposite, that the explosion would prove so powerful it would set the atmosphere on fire. A terrific storm, an electrical storm, started early in the morning, and the fear was it would spontaneously somehow detonate the device. 
The weather cleared just around 5.30. They started the countdown, and history began. I was there, 20 miles away from the explosion. And what I saw was disappointing. Just a little light on the horizon. We slightly go. And so I tried to look out. Aside from the dark glasses and protection. And suddenly, as we were in a complete dark room, the curtains would have been raised. The light was streaming in. That was perhaps not quite a minute after the explosion. Then I was impressed. It became brighter and brighter and rose, and we knew, I knew, that soon it will be used over Japan, and then it will not be just an experiment. After the test, engineers completed the construction of two bombs. Little Boy contained a uranium core. And Fat Man held the recently discovered plutonium. Harry Truman, who had assumed the presidency when FDR suddenly died, made the fateful decision that using the bombs would shorten the war and forestall a bloody invasion of Japan. On August 6, 1945, the US B-29 bomber Enola Gay took off with Little Boy for Hiroshima, Japan. At 8.15 a.m., from an altitude of 31,000 feet, it jettisoned its payload and raced away from the target area. The first part of the firing sequence was when wires, which were attached to the bomb and attached to the plane, pulled out. These started 15-second clock timer switches, which then made sure that the plane was completely away, that it had made this diving turn and was out of the area. At that point, the barometric switches passed control over to the radar antennae. These radar antennae detected how far off the ground the, plane, the bomb actually was. And at, at a 2,000 feet, they sent a firing signal back, which started an irreversible set of events leading to the nuclear explosion. Little Boy exploded with a force of 15 kilotons, or 15,000 tons of TNT. On August 9, 1945, at 1.02 a.m., the U.S. dropped Fat Man over Nagasaki, Japan. It exploded with the force of 21 kilotons of TNT. Temperatures at ground zero rose to approximately 7,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Wind velocity reached 620 miles per hour. Blast pressure was 4,600 pounds per square foot. Survivors who witnessed the explosions likened them to seeing another sun in the sky. The intense heat wave that followed the explosions destroyed all life within a radius of nearly two miles. Little Boy and Fat Man killed an estimated 200,000 people. As horrible as it is to say, it was a blessing because the Japanese people were able to surrender then. Their military did not permit them to surrender, would, wouldn't countenance it, until finally, after the second bomb was dropped, the emperor insisted upon it. Four years after Hiroshima, in August 1949, the Soviet Union shocked the West by detonating its first atomic weapon. By the end of that year, there were rumors that the Russians were close to producing a fusion, or hydrogen bomb, said to be a thousand times more powerful than the atomic bomb. Fusion is the opposite of fission, whereas fission is splitting apart, splitting a very heavy uranium or plutonium nucleus. With fusion, you're going to the other end of the periodic table of elements, to the very lightest ones, and you are fusing them or squeezing them together squeezing the nuclei together to make a new compound or a new element. The superheated material expands violently to cool itself, generating the enormous shockwave of a hydrogen blast. In January 1950, 
President Truman ordered the United States to investigate the possibility of producing hydrogen bombs. Physicist Edward Teller was placed in charge of the program. I worked on it probably longer than anybody else. Certainly earlier than anybody else, knowing what we did. The question of shall we now go ahead? Among the people who had enough access in Washington and enough reputation to be listened to, I was the only one who said it can be done and it should be done. Within three years, both the U.S. and Russia developed hydrogen bombs. Soon afterwards, both countries adopted the military strategy called MAD, for mutual assured destruction. Each side recognized that any full-scale use of nuclear weapons would decimate both nations. In the quantities in which it was ultimately produced, it would have ended civilization. If we had a nuclear exchange, as we might have had if we hadn't had reasonable leaders on both sides, the world as we know it could have been like Neville shoots on the beach. I mean, everybody might have been dead. During the Cold War, the overwhelming destructive firepower possessed by the superpowers actually helped avert a nuclear nightmare. But today, new terrors and new tactics have given rise to grave new threats. In the 21st century, Los Alamos, birthplace of the atomic bomb, continues to lead the way in American nuclear research. It's home to a facility called DART, that's short for Dual Axis Radiographic Hydrodynamic Test Facility. We want to understand how our weapons are going to work and if they're going to work reliably. Are they aging? Will they work if we ever need them? Are they safe as they currently are? DART is one way that we can run very controlled experiments with non-nuclear materials and understand the data. Much of the U.S. nuclear stockpile dates from the 1960s and 70s and has long exceeded its designed shelf life of 15 to 20 years. Will these aging warheads still detonate? Will they remain safe and secure in the event of an accident? Answering these questions becomes ever more difficult because the U.S. no longer tests actual warheads. International treaties enacted in 1962 and again in 1992 first moved nuclear tests underground and then banned them entirely. It's much like trying to maintain a fighter aircraft without ever being able to turn it on or fly it. You have to examine all the components of that piece of equipment study them very carefully, put them back together again, and then certify that if you need to fly that aircraft, it'll work. And that's what we have to do with nuclear weapons. DART tests the viability of America's nuclear weapons by simulating the effects of a nuclear blast under controlled laboratory conditions. CDS charge can begin. Five, five, four, three, two, one, fire. The instant of detonation is captured by two giant X-ray machines set at a right angle. They fire extraordinarily brief and intense flashes of radiation to create a 3D image. The actual X-ray images are classified. These computer simulations depict the type of activity seen during the explosions. The reason we have to use X-rays to penetrate these experiments is because they're very dense material, and the explosion is occurring very quickly. You could never film what's occurring inside the experiment with traditional cameras. You must penetrate it with x-rays to look through it. This is the electron beam accelerator that's the heart of the first start x-ray source. 
We make electrons and then convert those electrons into X-rays. The electrons are generated first here and then are accelerated in the electron beam accelerator itself. Think of the electron beam accelerator like a marble rolling down a staircase. Every time the marble reaches the stair, it gains energy as it falls down. Well, our marbles are electrons, and each time it reaches an area of the accelerator shown by one of these cans, it gains energy. A tremendous amount of power is generated to fire the high-powered X-ray bursts, which last less than one ten-thousandth of a second. Each of these power supplies produce 250,000 volts. When we combine their output, DART produces a 15 million volt pulse for 70 billionths of a second. As DART continues analyzing nuclear warheads, other organizations struggle to defend against a very different type of weapon. They're the bombs used by terrorists, so-called improvised explosive devices or IEDs. These homemade bombs have grabbed headlines and shattered the lives of thousands around the world. In Oklahoma City, Madrid, and London. Terrorists are not stupid. They don't just throw an IED out somewhere and hope somebody runs across it. Every single IED bomb has a target. The difference is it's hard for maybe somebody standing back um, to look at it and figure out what the target is. IEDs generally use basic materials and simple techniques. Any device that sends an electronic signal, a garage door opener, a TV remote, or a cell phone can trigger a deadly explosion. You're really going up against not something conventional, but somebody else's imagination, somebody else's mind. What can they put together? What can they come up with? And how can you be smarter than them and defeat it? The hardest terrorist to defeat is the one willing to give his life. What we face today is an extraordinary paradox. On the one hand, the developed nations have these weapons of enormous destruction, these megaton level nuclear weapons, capable of destroying a whole city. On the other hand, in this incredible asymmetry, we worry about people arriving inside a crowded pizza parlor with an explosive strapped around their waist. For decades, the threat of mutual assured destruction helped the U.S. and the Soviet Union to maintain a fragile peace. Today, a new global battle pits the world's most advanced weapons against low-tech terrorist explosives. The future is uncertain, but it seems clear that bombs will continue to play a decisive and devastating role in human affairs.